Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining us for our webinar with Marty Park, What Business Owners Need to Know About Recovering Well, Driving Sales Through the Recovery. Um, we're going to give, we've got a whole bunch of people on now, but as usual, I'm just going to give a couple more minutes for people to join or an, another minute or so, and then we'll get going. So uh, just hang tight and thank you so much for your patience and, and we're, uh, we're so pleased to have you. All right, I want to I want to make sure that we give uh, enough time to our guests today to uh, present on the topic. It's a hot topic, um, totally relevant right now, you know, and, and it really hits home for us. You know, how, how are we going to take advantage of or what are the opportunities in, in this problem? Um, you know, we try and see problems as opportunities and Marty's going to really try and bring that home from us for us. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Marty Park. Marty um, is the president of uh, Evolve Business Group. He's an excellent business coach uh, and an author uh, of, of, of a book called Tiger by the Tail. And I'm sure he'll uh, chat a little bit about that if he wants. And then uh, he's also a serial entrepreneur. He's fired up, led and, uh, and uh, failed and hit home runs at um tons of businesses and so without further ado uh marty hope that was a good introduction uh here you are <laughs> that was great quite thank you very much i appreciate it um so i wanted to be able to dive into uh sorry i'll do that back there we go um i do want to talk about driving sales because i think that uh sales in this period becomes the thing as businesses start to open back up it's the conversation that i'm having with so many people and so i'll just uh, give you some idea of uh, my background and a little bit about um, what I've done. As, as Clay mentioned, I did start my first business at the age of 21. As uh, anybody who's heard me speak before say, I thought I'd be retired at 21 and a half. Uh, I've gone on to have 13 companies in six different industries. And so I've got a lot of diversity in that startup operating companies. And with every one of them, uh, there's been a big push for sales and business development. And most of, my, most of my career has been focused around sales and marketing. Uh, that's where I naturally like uh, the, the pieces of business that I naturally tend to. And I found that with every company, if they're successful at sales and marketing, the rest of the business effectively takes care of itself. Um, I've had some good success over the years, uh, being a top 40 under 40 here, uh, represented Canada at the G20 Summit uh, for entrepreneurs. And uh, over, I went back and I looked and I've sold 18 products personally in my career. So 18 ranging from software to audio production, on hold messaging to franchises to uh, advertising and marketing services, you name it, there's been 18 different products. And so a lot of my experience here is, uh, is proven out the hard way. And then uh, as Clay mentioned, I have uh, last year launched a book called Tiger by the Tail and it is an Amazon bestseller. So I wanna get into sales today and talk a little bit about sales approach. Now I'm not gonna dive into, here's how to overcome objections or talk about your specific sales process because I think that's customized and unique to everybody. I'm also not going to speak about one individual thing. What I'm gonna talk about is the, really the idea that you coming back to sales, whether you're a business owner or you've got a couple of people in your business development group, I think these are uh, tools and ideas that every single person can put into place. And so that's where I'm really going to focus. Recognizing also that anything I talk about today, if you start doing it today, there is a lag time. You are going to see the results of your sales activity today in 30 days, 60 days, maybe even 90 days, depending on your sales cycle. So I can never say enough that if you want a silver bullet, the silver bullet is start now. In fact, you should have started yesterday. And so you're going to find that urgency is something that is a bit of a theme for me. 
Uh, I think coming out of COVID, I, a lot of people have been feeling like this. If anybody's ever seen me present, I always include Chris Farley somewhere in my presentation. Uh, but really the key here is you can't go into sales and be thinking about business development in your business or as somebody on the sales team with this feeling. And the reason for that is that the way you feel, the emotions you have and the confidence you bring to any selling process, any product or any service is critical that as you're sitting across the table from people or across a Zoom call, that your confidence and your general emotion is one of now's the time you feel good about it. There isn't any apprehension on your side. And so prospects and your clients are coming back to the market and they're already feeling a little unsure. They're already a little nervous, right? Whether it be about safety or whatever, you cannot share that. You have to be able to show up every day and be ultra clear that it is now is the time. It is a great time to buy. It's a great time to restart things because your confidence and your clarity needs to outweigh their indecision. It needs to outweigh their wishy-washiness, their, their feeling that if I don't make a decision or I procrastinate, that that's going to be less risk. So your emotional state is really going to be a driver here. And I think I would just want you to make a note to check in and say, okay, if there's any issues I have, uh, I have to work that out. Otherwise, they're going to show up in all of my sales performance day to day. Before COVID-19, selling looked a little bit like this. We went through features, benefits. We went, we talked about value, maybe a bit of a, about price in that equation or in that conversation. And we oftentimes talked about ROI, the return on investment if somebody bought this. But we had the ability to ignore some of the people side because business was good and we could focus on some of those things that were really driven by our product or service. In selling after COVID or at this period of, you know, somewhat I'll call it the slow recovery, Really one of the key features now that you need to lead with is safety. And it's not only safety as in a restaurant where it's safe to come in our dining room, but it's also safe to be able to do transactions, that the risk isn't as high as people perceive. That, and, and there's been so much fight or flight for people that oftentimes, and I've seen it over the last few months and I'm sure Clay has, people who are not totally rational. Business owners, uh, I had a gentleman phone and say, should I lay everybody off? why there's been no change in your sales, but irrationally he said, but somebody else in our industry is laying everybody else off, so maybe I should. And you realize that's not coming from a place of logic, it's coming from a place of panic. In selling, your prospects, your clients still may be in a bit of place of panic or fight or flight, and you have to bring them back and talk about safety of making a decision, safety of maybe a physical safety, but that becomes a number one topic. The second one is trust developing trust and them feeling like that somebody is leading with relationship and a good conversation and not just pushing a product or service becomes now critical. Then ROI actually increases in priority. And the reason that return on investment increases is because at the nervousness people have and the fear of risk or making a mistake or losing cash now starts to mean that I'm thinking about everything I buy on when can I use it? What am I going to get out of it? So as I think about any service or product, I think about the ROI on that investment because there's that sense of scarcity around cash in businesses and in people's consumers. And you have to be able to look and say, okay, encouraging them that this is the best place to put your money. This is the best ROI becomes important. And then the next piece around that is value. And so there's a little bit of a shift in values, not as high a priority as talking about ROI and those things aren't nearly as important as safety and trust now. That means that instead of if you've ever looked and sold like this guy, the used car salesman or just thought it's just a matter of numbers, you really have to think about your selling process and how you show up for sales as being more like Oprah. Oprah is one of the best salespeople on the planet and it's because everybody feels they know Oprah. They have a relationship with Oprah, right? They know about her personally. And because of all of that personalness, that connection, that trust factor, Oprah can sell Weight Watchers, she can sell whatever she wants to people, and they buy it in droves. But she's really aware that it's not driven by a slick sales presentation or features and benefits. It's driven by her enthusiasm, her confidence, and her relationship with people. So think about how you can emulate Oprah in that capacity. So a big thing I'm gonna talk about is that sales is now an everyday experience. It's sales every single day. And what I mean by that is so often business owners and a lot of salespeople, in fact, or people to business development people are focused on the activity of selling two or three or maybe four days a week. But it is now something you need to be doing every single day. What I mean by that is the tracking of sales, that 
this can no longer be something, I have a spreadsheet that is open every single day on my computer and I am tracking sales. I'm tracking the progress of every prospect. I'm updating it. I'm checking in with who I haven't talked to, but there should be no confusion about where your numbers are in sales, where every prospect is, where your customers are, who is buying. If you're not getting reports like that on a regular basis, you need to start and be reviewing them every day. I love the idea that with my sales team that there is a daily, a weekly, and a monthly sales goal. And we again are tracking. Uh, I've seen this work super effectively across teams that when you educate people on this is what we need to sell every day in order to survive and also thrive, people uh, subconsciously just rise to the occasion. So at the end of every week, being able to check in with your team or even with you if you're a solopreneur, it's critical that you have a goal, an objective every time. Now, this might be sales on a weekly basis, but on a daily basis, it's going to be an activity goal that ideally leads you to that weekly and monthly sales goals. This needs to become a team discussion. The number of companies I come into and say, well, when do you guys talk about sales? And they say, oh, well, the sales team talks about it every Monday. I was like, when does the rest of the organization talk about it? It doesn't happen in most companies. You need to have somebody, if it's not, if you're, again, a small business and you don't have somebody, then there's got to be somebody outside your organization that you talk to. I often reference my good friend, Dominic. He and I talked this morning about sales. What have you closed this week? What do you have on track? Where's that at? He and I provide that team accountability and that enthusiasm around sales that you're going to get in a team discussion. I love the idea of celebration, that an organization needs to start to celebrate sales and it becomes part of Hey, everybody, the receptionist to the admin people to your consultants, everybody gets jazzed about, hey, sales, we're celebrating it. And it's the easiest way to bring sales to the forefront of the discussion without necessarily, I guess, the traditional sales manager approach of, I want to know about your numbers and I want to know what you did. And it's all sort of the heavy handed accountability. So celebration is an easy way to do that. Uh, I, I like the idea that sales is part of the new culture that, hey, everybody in our organization sells, we encourage sales, we love sales. That's the type of language that you have to have. And again, if it's just you, you have to look and say, okay, is my personal culture include sales as being a positive thing and a focus every single day? And then the last thing I'd mention is that sales now needs to include everyone. If prior to this, and I just did a webinar with a, a client company where they have, the owner has traditionally been the business development guy. Uh, he's got 14 team members and he no longer can support all 14 people just on his efforts. And we've now had to call on or ask other people to step into a sales role. Now it's not everybody making cold calls, but the reception is responsible for touching base with clients. Uh, some of their consultants and their delivery people are now talking to clients and educating them on all the services they provide. Everybody has found a role in sales and they are practicing it every week. Every single Friday, they have an action the following week that they're going to take in sales. And so it's now an everyone organization or an everyone in the organization sales effort. And that's going to make a big difference. I, I like this picture because I think it sort of uh, exemplifies the before and after. So we, the, the ground has fallen out from under us with this COVID situation. There was before where we were on a steady trajectory. We now have the ability where we've sort of crossed the chasm and business starts to come back. But that being said, a lot of things that's happened, and I'll give you an example, is renewing sales goals. And the reason this becomes important, so I had a client who in January said, our goal is $3.6 million in gross revenue. During the, month of, uh, during the last few months with COVID, they've said, our sales goal is zero. Our sales goal is survival. Our sales goal is just keeping our people. Our sales goal is, in a lot of ways, panic. And now we've come back to say, Okay, well now it's July, we're six months in, we are back to the market, we're seeing people start to buy, we've got prospects, our marketing is working again, we're getting inbound leads. What is our sales goal now? And with this, I wanna be able to address the idea of, do you reduce the goal? Do you say, okay, well, listen, I've lost three months, I lost the second quarter of 2020, so I'm gonna reduce it by you know, 25%. Or do you look and say and challenge yourself to say, okay, how do we bring it back? There's a real risk with reducing your sales goal. And the reason for that is that, and it's mostly mental. If you say to everybody, listen, we're going to reduce the sales goal by, we lost three months to COVID, so we're going to reduce it by 25%. You now open the door for any time there's a challenge, whether it be societal, 
uh, in your industry, oil prices are down, uh, housing starts are slow, whatever it might be, to be able to say, oh, well, we'll just reduce the goal. I never want my sales group and I never want my organization to think that whenever things get tough, we just reduce our goals. So I would challenge you to bring it back and to be able to start to figure out with six months left, how many more sales per month for the remaining six months do you need to make in order to recover Q2? And my favorite way to do that is with the classic thermometer. Now, it doesn't necessarily need to be this specific type of image, but I actually found this and I loved it because it says, hey, we're this far of this month's goal. There's 28 days remaining. But where I like this is actually thinking about, you know, some of those classic fundraisers, the, the church who's trying to raise $10,000 and they slowly, the thermometer works up. And the important thing there is the incremi incrementalization of a broad goal. So let's say, for example, you want to you, you need to increase or make up $400,000 in sales for the balance of the year. To do that, you're not going to do it in one transaction of 400K. You're going to do it in transactions of 10, 20, 30, maybe $50,000. And so you almost need to be able to take this thermometer and the same way if it was actually printed on the wall in our office and we'd mark it up and be able to slowly increase the, you know, the mercury inside or the temperature inside till we hit that goal. It's the exact same thing. There's nothing worse than having a sales goal that everybody sees as 400 with no, no ability to visualize every single day or every single week. I love the idea that if you have something like this, that it's printed off in the office and it is something that literally people are taking a Sharpie pen or a felt marker and slowly filling it in. And every week we're seeing that 400K to 380, to 360, to 350, to 300, to 280, and it just counts down. As Soon as people start to see some momentum on the sales side, they are going to become believers again. And that's going to allow you to start to move into that sales. This is true if you're just an individual, you have to look at, what you're trying to come back from and incrementalize is that and either into dollars or into the number of deals. If you know you really need to get 18 clients to make up for it, great, then this thermometer's just got a goal of 18 individual accounts. I'm a big fan of measuring activity. And the reason for that is activity is the leading indicator of future sales potential. This is the most critical thing in the world. Oftentimes people, I could, we can look at a business and say, hey, Q3 is gonna be terrible for you. And they say, why? And we say, well, we look at the activity of your sales group or your company as a whole, and it's nowhere near the level it needs to be in order to be successful. And I'll tell you what I mean by this, or I'll explain this out in a uh, little demonstration. Oh, but the last thing I should mention with activity is COVID-19 activity is way down. There is no shortage of salespeople and business owners who have stepped away from sales, either because they've bought into the story that nobody's buying right now, or they've just said, you know, out of respect, we're not going to push people. But there's certainly been people who have said, I'm working hard from home, and I can think of a couple guys I know right off the bat who about 12.30 in the day are cracking a beer, and they look more like Homer Simpson than they do a activity giant. And so we have to get back to flexing that activity muscle. So here's an example of a business, and this could be across a team, across an individual owner, but normally what happens is uh, knowing your numbers. So I've taken down the left-hand side, uh, six different tools, you know, doing some direct mail, cold calls, a networking event, advertising, they're on social media, and they run an AdWords account through Google. And so you look at the volume that they produce on a monthly basis. And so let's presume they need 10 leads in order to be able to get a new client. And so this business, as they started it out, and maybe this, let's call this pre-COVID values, that they were able to generate 17 leads a month. And from that, that they were generating about two clients. Some months it was two, other months it's one. But they now realize that to really get back to be on pace, they need to increase the activity. So instead of having the mailers, instead of doing 100 mail pieces a month, it's got to go up to 125. That's going to increase, just give me one extra lead. But what I'm doing is instead of, if you belong to a networking group, you need to join a second one. If you're doing some advertising, you need to double it. If you've got social media, you've gotta be posting twice as much. And certainly with AdWords, you've gotta be able to increase the number of impressions so that you've got that ability to be able to say, now I can generate 30 leads, which is three clients. It's almost the exact uh, connection. But I've done this over and again with individual salespeople and with companies and they never track the results of their actual activity to the number of leads it generates, and then knowing that the number of leads are going to get there. They say, well, we need to pick up three accounts a month. And so here's an easy example of how I'd work it back. 
I need three accounts, which mean I need 30 prospects. This is the amount of activity I need to now produce to get my 30 prospects. And so that is a great place to be able to look and say, is this something I was tracking or can now start to track again as an individual And this could be your activity for a given week or across an entire group of people in your company. I'd mark this as a bit of a to-do item. I think that knowing your numbers and being able to work this backwards is absolutely a key to success. The other reason I like that is because in terms of knowing your numbers is all of those sales predictors are going to be able to allow you to manage cash flow into the future and be able to know what the cash is looking like in the coming months and project that. Uh, it gives you some element of a weighted sales projection. Uh, oftentimes I deal with sales teams where they just count the total and they go, oh man, we've got $4 million in the pipe. But when they actually look at the likelihood of them closing, it oftentimes works out to be 25% of that. And so I have to be able to weight my sales projections, which is something else that even as an individual with every lead we have in our company, we say, what's the likelihood of them closing? And because that spreadsheet's open every day, we update it every day as we get emails and interaction with people. And then the last thing is total pipeline value. Um, when I had a marketing agency, we knew that uh, we had to have 3.6 million in total prospective deals because we needed to sell $600,000 and have it close every single quarter. And that if our total pipeline value wasn't about 3.6, out of that, we wouldn't get 600,000 in sales. So that's something else that a lot of people don't know, but coming out of COVID and into recovery now, you need to be thinking about, hey, how many total lead values do I need to have? What does that pipeline of sales need to look like so that I know that I'm gonna be able to make my actual close numbers and my actual revenue numbers per quarter. I wanna talk a little bit about sales time. Now, I didn't say sale time like we're gonna go shopping. What I mean is sales time, setting your sales time. This is just an example of a salesperson's calendar where every single activity is designed around selling. Now, this may not be most business owners and even a lot of business development people, but the thing that I find most critical is I look at, I talk to people every week and I say, what part of your week is committed to sales? And they say, well, you know, I just, whenever I get a chance, I do sales. I have to tell you in this recovery, the absolute thing that everybody in your organization needs to have is set sales time. I would describe these as two hour blocks of time. The reason it has to be two hours is because we always have the ability to fritter away at least 30 minutes, getting a new coffee, updating the CRM, getting our comfortable chair. Oh, my database crashed. I've got to get back into it. Whatever excuses we find to be able to not start. And so I like the idea that over the course of two hours, the other thing is I think, well, I've done 30 minutes of prospecting or I followed up with all the leads I have. I still have 90 minutes left. It forces you in a two hour block to get creative to say, well, what else can I do in sales? Because I've got another hour. And that is a critical piece to this. I like to do it away from my desk. Sitting at my desk is the least effective place for me to do sales work. I pick up the things I need for sales. Oftentimes I print my database off. I move it from a spreadsheet and I print it off and I work off a piece of paper. But the only thing there is my phone, the piece of paper, and there's no distractions. Get away from your desk, your email and all the alarms to be able to focus. Um, tell other people that you're selling. Let people know. I found this with owners that you tell other people, listen, from 10 to 12 every day, I'm selling and I'm working on business development. Uh, they have an opportunity to join in on that, but at least they respect that that's what you're doing and they know that it's uh, it's driving activity for everybody. Um, and I do like if you have the ability to make it a team time. I found with clients in the past that if they can be able to say, all right, we're all going to do this. Uh, it's incredible how much activity they can generate. And it also points out how little they were doing before. Oftentimes people say, well, you know, I'm making a few calls every week and that turns out to be two or three when their target number needs to be 20. So I love this idea of sales time in your calendar every single week as being a critical thing. The reason this is so important is because otherwise, when do you do it? There's this famous thing, if you've ever, in my case, have done a lot of sales training with people. It's always Friday. You know, Monday, you don't feel like selling and nobody, nobody wants to talk to anybody in sales or talk about business development Monday. So Tuesday, we'll do it. And then Tuesday, you're like, oh, I'm so busy following up with clients, but Wednesday, I'm going to get to it. And before you know it, it's happy Friday. And Friday is always the day you say, nobody's good at, nobody wants to talk sales on Friday. So Monday, I'm going to be all over it. And the weeks just roll by. If it is not in your calendar every single day, man, it's, a, it's before you know it, the month of July will be gone, August will be gone, and you'll be in a hurting cash flow position for September. You have to start now for September. 
So let's talk about where do we start. And I think the critical place is our clients. You have to look at past clients, existing clients that may have stopped with you, but anybody that you can classify as a client. And I'll, and I'll drill down on some of that. The first thing I got to do is be able to just invite them back. Um, it's shocking to me the number of people who haven't just gone through and either announced over social media, uh, through their database and email, um, by telephone, but it, letting people know we're open. The number of times even my wife and I in the last couple of weeks have said to ourselves, I wonder if they're open yet. I don't know. And we are not sure what business is open. We don't know what consultants are firing on all cylinders and which people are traveling or not traveling or have got an online program that they're now delivering. Or you have to educate people and invite them back. I think the next thing you need to look at is some flexibility and upselling them, downselling them, cross-selling them the way the services that they may have consumed before or the, the products they bought, the order volumes, frequency, all of that might change. So you have to be able to say, okay, here, we're gonna, you know what? You were at the weekly frequency and now we're gonna put you at bi-weekly. We're going to upsell you into something that's got more care, more attention, more services. Uh, potentially some of your clients may have laid off some of their staff and may need more outsourced stuff from you. There is an opportunity to upsell there, but just being flexible on, you know, not necessarily having package A, B, and C, and those are the choices for people. It has to be more flexible. And that might include new programs. I think for anybody who's been a personal trainer or at a gym, there's been a proliferation of new programs being offered online. Now, as things open back up, now you have the ability to say upsell, downsell. Well, you can come into the gym sometimes, or you can do it online. You can, the restaurant, obviously, now you can come in and dine, but you can still pick it up at the curb. We still deliver to home. There's all sorts of new programs. Let people know that, your customers. I think to reduce their risk and increase the safety for customers, we have to talk about guarantees. Now, I don't mean a guarantee that's just, you know, 100% satisfaction or your money back necessarily, but guarantees around everything from delivery time. That's been a frustration for people with it uh, delivered, even Ikea. Um, I know a number of people who, while they've talked about all their online, their availability of product, ability to maintain inventory and to be able to deliver in a reasonable time, uh, they've lost a lot of business and a guarantee might be a program that brings that back with their customers. And then uh, payment terms. I know a client of mine who has a unit cost of about 3,600 bucks. They've just implemented a 12 month, $300 a month uh, payment term and it is driving sales. People no longer are comfortable with the risk of $3,600 out at once. They quickly realized, oh, with a payment term system, we've adjusted that risk for customers. We've created more trust. Now we, the ROI goes up and, uh, and, the, and the value's there. And so they've hit all of those hot buttons with payment, payment terms and new ways to finance things. I really just wanna focus a minute on care and uh, I think the big thing here is I, I don't know how much you care until you really connect with me, whether it's by Zoom, FaceTime, phone, like really connect with me as a human. Please stop connecting with me by email. It has to be through this idea of making a visual connection, even by Zoom like we are today or by on Teams or on an online platform. Uh, it's more effective to see somebody and be able to make that connection with your customers. Asking those simple questions, how are you? Before we dive into which product you need, you wanna start ordering again, ask them how they are. How can we help? Is there anything? When you lead with how are you and how can we help? The question of what product mix or what package they need or how they need to buy your services is going to become very clear. This is something that my coach asked me about uh, two months ago. He said, how many people have you got in your database? I said about 880. He said, have you called your entire database yet? My first response was probably the same as yours. Are you mad? No, I haven't called everybody. He's like, what are you waiting for? There's 880 people that might need your help. Get on the phone with them. You, you wonder what you're gonna do for your two hours of sales time. Phone everybody you're connected with and reconnect with those people. And I gotta tell you, there is a whole bunch of work there um, that's come out. I was actually just speaking to a past client in real estate this morning, we bumped into each other. And one of the things we talked about was that very thing of reconnecting with everybody in his database. We started doing that in the fall and uh, probably it took him about four months to get through to everybody. And within a couple of weeks, he started to see the first deal. He's now had a very, very busy spring in real estate. And it is because he said of all the work he's done connecting with his existing circle of influence and customer base. Let's talk about prospective customers or prospects. 
we really what we need to do here is reheat them, right? So much like the microwave, we're going to take the old leftovers of prospects, those people that you probably didn't talk to for two months, or maybe they didn't respond to your email for two months, and we got to reheat them and get that going again. And so I hope your prospects are better than something left over like this guy's putting in the microwave. But let's presume that there's gold in some of that there. And I want to walk through some of the ways to approach prospects or prospective customers. The first thing is prospects have a really short memory. You know, they may have been totally interested in your service three months ago, but their whole life has been turned up down, upside down, quite literally. And so you need to reconnect and re-educate them and even just remind them of, hey, this is why we were talking. This is the place you were in. This was the value we saw. And I, my favorite example of this is, uh, actually doesn't come from COVID, but comes from stampede time in Calgary. That oftentimes after stampeding for 10 days, and I would have to phone people, and I would have to remind them of all the things we talked about. Do you remember it was Wednesday, we were at the big tent, we were drinking Coronas, you said this, I said that, and then they're like, oh yeah, you're the guy, right. And I would have to re-educate them and almost start my whole presentation over again to get them back to the starting point, or rather, I guess in this case, the COVID ending point. And that's the first step. And I probably need with prospects now some sort of a deal or incentive to get them in, right? I need something that is going to create some momentum where there's been nothing but procrastination, pause, everything's on hold. So I really need something that is going to increase the value proposition. And I like the idea that instead of everybody I've talked to has said, well, should I slash my price? So we, should we cut prices? Should we be giving a sale? I like the idea that instead add value. If you're, what else are you going to provide as value add and just keep loading on the value, right? The last thing you need is to cut your price, cut your margins and be doing sales transactions where you make less money. So keep your price exactly where it is and just load stuff on, right? If uh, I have a friend who uh, does a lot of, has done a lot of training work. A lot of his training business has gone quiet. He's been doing more online training, but now he's including a series of webinars. He's including one-on-one -on -one coaching calls with each of the participants. He's including an ebook. I mean, he's built out an entire value add package so that the pricing for all this is comparable to him doing the live coaching because going from him doing, sorry, the live training, him doing live training at $10,000 a day to doing a $99 online webinar isn't going to cut it, right? He, he can't get a thousand people into that program or uh, hundreds of people into the program. So we've had to figure out how do we get the value back up to full, full, uh, full strength. Next thing I mentioned is, hey, we've got new programs. There's gotta be something new. We've adapted, we've pivoted, We've done something, but here's how we're now presenting it. Here's how we're offering our services for your customers. Uh, I mentioned again, guarantees, the same reason. You wanna reduce the risk for people. Um, I like the idea that maybe it's time sensitive, that hey, for the next 60 days, here's what we're doing. People, if there's enough value and 60 days, for anybody who's ever watched a late night infomercial, it's only available now. If you call now, you get the second set of Ginsu knives. There's a reason they do that in late night infomercials, it works. I like the idea that there's a gift with a purchase. I have seen uh, the simplest example. I was in a liquor store the other day. I bought a bottle of vodka. I bought the one that came with a little sweater. If anybody knows, it's Tito's. And uh, yeah, the little gift went a long way. I don't care what it is. I've seen gifting work with custom homes. I've seen it work with um, uh, or meals ordered in for your home. I've seen it with consulting services. There's all sorts of gifting opportunities here. The last thing I'd ask you about prospective customers is, are they really prospects? And what I mean by that is so many people tend to go, well, we got 30, 35 people and we just kind of rehash what's going on with the Smiths and the Johnsons and the Browns. And, and really you have to stop and say, are these people prepared to buy something? That might mean you ask them, are you interested in this service? Are you prepared to buy it? Uh, I had somebody, and if anybody wants to, um, I think my friend Kevin is on this uh, webinar. Kevin and I have talked about the nine word email. If you're interested in that, you're welcome to email me at the end uh, and ask me about the nine word email. I used it this morning and got an instant response back with the person saying, yes, 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 we're interested. I just need two weeks to be able to start. But so if you're not sure if they're prospects, you've got to be pointed in asking because a no is better than a maybe. So let me ask you. Our whole life is on Zoom these days. So how do you make Zoom or the idea of virtual 
an effective selling platform. And I think one of the critical ways to do that is try to bring back experience into a Zoom call. And what I mean by that is, you know, the ability to use something physical. Uh, so I, I have a book out and I sent it to a lady. And so in advance of things, uh, I actually FedExed it around the world. She was in Saudi Arabia. And so I FedExed the book. It arrived at her doorstep in Saudi Arabia. And then we got on Zoom. The impact of the physicality of the book arriving and her being able to open it was an experience outside of our Zoom call, but it enriched our Zoom call. I'll give you that example for uh, one of our clients who's a custom home builder. They build homes that are typically around $2 million. They used to have a great sales process where they would sit down with people at their show home or at one of their homes with a architect, with a designer. They would have wine, charcuterie, and they would brainstorm. And literally, uh, the architect would draw renderings as they talked and they would map it all out. And it was such an experience that four to five people said, let's go. And they moved towards a sale. He said, well, now what do I do? I'm stuck with Zoom. What they started doing was drop shipping the wine and the charcuterie at the people's door uh, about an hour before the Zoom call. They still got everybody on Zoom, but now everybody was sharing, you know, so the, the uh, prospects were having wine and charcuterie, were already loving the process, and then they get on Zoom. So you have to recognize that the experience is really not through the screen. It's all the other things you can send them in advance. It's the things that can show up by courier at that moment. If you don't have a courier FedEx account, um, the ability to be able to drop ship something on their door, you know, within a certain time frame, uh, don't use Canada Post because they've been a disaster through the COVID crisis for getting things there on time. Um, pay for the service so that there's a guarantee when it arrives. That's one of the best ways I've seen across all my clients of making things work. Um, yeah, and, and that can be not only for the idea of a sale, but also reconnecting with your customers is a great thing to do. Send them a basket that they can be enjoying and then zoom in to see how everybody's eating the basket in their boardroom, right? All the little treats and stuff they're sharing. So where else would I focus? Um, I've talked about, you know, going back to customers first. I talked about the ability to really dive into your prospects the activity level that you need to increase to and how you need to measure that. Where we're talking to clients now is where can you generate a multiple sale versus a single transaction? And what I mean by that is where is there someone who can buy from you six more times between now and December versus somebody that's going to do a single transaction? So um, with our contractor clients, um, you know, like the plumber, the electrician, we're looking for renovation companies that will be doing multiple deals. We're looking for the property management companies who have ongoing work. Uh, we're looking for uh, the oil and gas guys are focused on uh, clients who are going to be doing repeated projects, right? There's some that they know are just stalled for the next six months. We've just sort of put them on the back burner. We're only focusing on people where we think there could be multiple transaction opportunities. Another one for me is alliance partners. And I think this is a great place to be spending some sales time and prospecting. This webinar, in fact, is a great opportunity uh, to promote and get in front of people. And I say that because Clay's clients, not all of Aiken Henderson's clients are my clients, obviously. Um, very few, they don't overlap. But there's people on this call that may not know me, uh, but know Clay. They know Aiken Henderson. And so we're sharing this opportunity doing this together but it gets me in front of his client base and i've promoted his name and the webinar series to all of my client base and so i look to say there's the again the ability to reach a whole audience of people that i typically wouldn't get at as a selling person one prospect one contact ever after another so you have to look for leverage that way i've been asked saying into the marketplace offer to just help offer to be able to lend your expertise to lend your credibility to lend the ability to offer to help into the marketplace is going to drive some business. Maybe not immediately, so don't lose sight of the fact you've got to be out doing selling activities. But I love the idea that if your intention is to be helping, you're inevitably going to come across opportunities. Another place I like is the idea of LinkedIn. And uh, LinkedIn, because so many of us have hundreds and hundreds of prospects on LinkedIn and really never talk to those people. And so making, having a concentrated effort, and if you want information on some different tools you can use, whether it be Sales Navigator, plugins like Duck Soup, other things, uh, there's all sorts of opportunity, and, and you can email me afterwards with uh, just LinkedIn, and we can talk about that. 
So after all this, I want you to be able to just say to yourself, have I got enough leads right now? Have I got enough leads that I can see in the coming months into the fall? And if the answer is no, then you have to look and say the lack of prospects and leads is also a lack of marketing. And so while the emphasis of this is around selling, if at the end of the day, you really are like, I've got all the time in the world and I have nobody to phone, you have to be able to look and say, well, let's make that a little easier than, you know, traditionally going to, traditionally years ago, you would have gone to the yellow pages and there was a giant book of at least companies you could phone. Now, because Google and a Google search is our primary platform, it's way more difficult to even build out those lists. So let's talk about ramping up your marketing. And this is something I touched on at the beginning of COVID, but I think it's just as relevant today and I just have one slide on it. More marketing means AdWord campaigns. There are people for every single one of our clients, whether it's aviation services, pipeline surveillance, uh, dam safety engineering, um, plumbing, electrical, uh, legal services, family law. I mean, I could just go through the list of every single client we have. Uh, financial services for seniors, you name it. People are searching for their services. If you don't have an active AdWords campaign, hire somebody, I can direct you to people, Clay can too, but you have to be doing some digital marketing that way. Updating your website, making all the, up, there's things that have changed about your business that people need to be able to identify and remarketing that when people are visiting your website, you're able to track them as they travel around the website and they you are just popping up in front of them. Uh, if you don't know what remarketing is, glad to explain that or go over that later. Uh, database marketing. Clients, and I'm talking to people over the last few months, they're sitting on hundreds and even thousands of names and email addresses and haven't sent out anything besides their COVID announcement saying they're closed. Man, there is gold within that database. Just keep asking people, making offers, inquiring. What do you want to see? But there's engagement there. Um, I love the idea of an active referral program. I've got referral partners that we actively refer back and forth. I have a small network and it, it drives so much business. Uh, Google reviews, if you don't have an emphasis on that, you absolutely need to. It's the easiest way to get good rankings. Uh, I mentioned alliances. I mentioned LinkedIn as being critical. Uh, advertorials are my favorite type. If you're going to spend money on advertising, advertorials that really profile your business or you as a business person are great. Um, I put down the list again, posting on social because people think that, oh, if I start an Instagram page that I'm going to get business from it. Maybe a year from now, but not likely just by it's done with the way social works and the visibility of your social postings to your whole network. Now, if you want to start an advertising campaign on social, that's different and that does have merit, but I, that's a whole other um, animal to learn about the social um, environment there. And then the last thing I put is advertising. So I want to leave with this because I think this is a critical piece. No matter, I have found that for anybody, whether it be a business owner trying to drive business for themselves, uh, a salesperson, a sales team, that the two words that are consistent and uh, that, that I should, I can't use one of the words, the word that is the most prevalent or the most relevant all the time are these two, consistency and persistence. They are number one, the way to success. And I want to build this out. And some people have probably seen this because uh, they did this study and they uh, these are classic sales things, but I found that to be absolutely true. 48% uh, of salespeople never follow up with a prospect. The number of times I've said to somebody, yeah, I'm interested in talking and there's been nothing. They never follow up with me. It boggles my mind how those people stay in sales. After that, another 25% 25 25 of people will make a second contact and stop. And this is where all of us as business owners and salespeople start to say, Oh, I, they haven't gotten back to me. I don't know if they're interested. I, I, I'm going to, and the story you tell is they're not interested when that's not true at all. The story is they're busy. They're recovering from COVID and the pandemic. They're trying to restart their business and get their own sales pipeline going. So the key here is that only 10% of salespeople, one in 10 people makes more than three contacts. I have found that once I get somebody, my favorite expression, old school expression was you either buy or you die. You never leave my database. And it's true that I know that eight out of 10 of my sales are when I have reached out with people over and over again. I know that they have an interest. It's just no has always been a no, not right now. So consistency and persistence, stay with people. Don't just make a phone call or send an email and presume that they're uninterested. If you had a conversation with them a year ago, go back to them. There's still an opportunity there. But this idea of getting down to the 
the, the last, the, where people won't go. When everybody else says, I'm gonna quit, you're the person who says, I've gotta stick with it. And your sales team has that same approach. If you know that you're going to do more on the sales side than your competitors are, you inevitably will have long-term success. The last things I wanna leave you with are just my email, Marty Park. You can visit, uh, my email is really easy. It's actually marty at martypark.com or you can do it on my website. Um, I have wrote this book and it's 99 Secrets to Tame and Master Your Business. And you can visit, check it out at tigerbythetailbook.com. Um, but I'm glad to talk to anybody on the call about sales strategy, sales ideas, sales challenges, or broader business strategy. I'm glad to tie that in with Clay and be able to uh, tag team him uh, with him on that and just add value to anybody who's on the webinar today. And uh, that's about it, Clay. Other than that, I'd, I'd hand it over to you and, and say thanks for the opportunity to present again. Yeah, thank you so much, Marty. Your, uh, your, your insights are outstanding and, and a lot of that really rings true to me um, and our organization. And, and, you know, we can kind of see why sales are picking up at Aiken Henderson because we're doing a lot of the right things, but certainly there's a few, you know, we've got a bit of, bit of way to go. Um, I just want to uh, mention on the right hand side, there's a space for questions, which we can engage in a dialogue. So if anybody has any questions, there's a 20 second delay on this video. So I'm going to talk about um, what Aiken Henderson's doing with this webinar series for a little bit, and then hopefully we've got some questions to answer. So um, we're going to slow down the cadence of the webinar series here for a little bit, but we will be posting and sending out notifications on replies. If you've enjoyed the webinar series, just as Marty has indicated, every one of our follow-up emails has a link to Google reviews. Please leave us a Google review. Even if you're not a client, if you've enjoyed the content that, you've, that we've put out or you've found what we're doing to be helpful, say that on Google. It makes such a world of difference. Our web traffic has increased dramatically um, and uh, we're able to help a lot more people uh, by you just leaving that one, one little review. Um, also, so I think we're going to uh, probably have one or two over the summer and then we'll pick up the cadence again in September. Haven't really formalized that, although we do have a lineup of rock star presenters. Um, okay, let's head over to the questions. That's enough about me. Thank you. Have the book. Great. So it's just people praising you and thanking you um, so far. No questions so far. <laughs> yeah, so well done. Thank you, Marty. Um, okay, I see people are starting to drop off. We'll give it another minute or so. And uh, Marty, I don't know if you have any. What what is the nine word email? Uh, that's what I want to know about. So, because I sent out. I, sorry, just to just to fill this in, I I got a sure. question for, after one of these webinars, a technical question on one of the government programs on you know, hey, um, what about this in this government program? And I'm going, oh wow, this is a lead that we've been working on closing for two years. And they're just popping back up now for some, for some, you know, uh, some advice effectively. And so I replied with this big drawn out email about, hey, would you like to be our client yet? And uh, so now you're telling me I can reduce that to nine words. I'd love to know what the nine words are. Sure. So the, the nine words and it would be different for everybody. But at the end of the day, the nine word email of the response is probably, are you still interested in accounting? Question mark. The problem most people get into when we respond by email is we start with like, Clay, how's it going? I hope you're recovering nicely, blah, blah, blah. You know, last year we were talking about, and it becomes this narrative. And people look at that and immediately go, oh, yeah, I'll deal with that later. When you pointedly ask somebody a simple question, they have nowhere else to go, right? Yeah, if I respond give me the opportunity to say yes or no. Right, and so it really is a, Clay, are you still interested in blank? What's your business? Question mark. And then what happens is people get it and they go, oh, and it is so to the point, they, the, the ability to ignore it goes away. Now, so I can help anybody wordsmith it in terms of how it might fit for them, but that's the basics of it. Fair enough. Reed is asking, uh, we only sell online. Is there any other suggestions? Um, if you're just online, I mean, I, I think that that's a good question because if you're online, then the, the marketing piece becomes critical. Now, I think one of the things that I've seen with online is that oftentimes people get a lot of uh, activity in, but their response time is slow and they lose sales. So I guess what I'd look at is, uh, is your response time happening fast enough? Are you offering maybe that value add or bundling to be able to convert right now where people might be sort of tire kicking? Are you remarketing so that your product and service follows them around the internet, that as they visit other websites, they're seeing your product or service to bring you back? Oftentimes with online, 
I'm still shopping. So I'll visit your website. I'll go to one of your competitors or a third companies. And if you're the one smart enough to remarket to me, if I'm not making a buying decision in that second, then you're the one that stays with me. The other people become a place that I visited, got the price and I moved on. Um, I think that responsiveness and, and probably a little more marketing focus is key though. Yeah, yeah, we've, you know, we've, we've spent a lot of time on that at Aiken Henderson, just making sure that wherever possible, even if it's an automation that's handling a little bit of the responsiveness, but we actually sure. hired uh, a human um, who's actually producing this right now, Ronnie, say hi, um, to, to, to take care of people when they're coming in the door. Like we have a resource that's exclusively devoted to taking people, taking care of people while they're coming in the door. And guess what? They're not an accountant. Right, they're they're uh, they're uh, what I like to say is a normal human, because um, you know not to dehumanize accountants, but uh, we're not we're not oft, often good at the soft stuff, right? So we're we're pretty good at uh, technical things, and so you know it was it was pretty obvious to us that we needed to make sure that the front end was taken care of well by someone who was high empathy, um, high responsibility for getting back to people, etc. So you know that really rings home for me, um, and we're largely an online business now. So um, you know, and, thank you. And Clay, I love that. Because you're the only accounting firm I know that has somebody like Ronnie in place who, you know, can help with the customer service and the experience of dealing with your accounting firm. And we're always making yeah. it better, too. Okay, Rita says, great, thanks. Any other suggestions for an executive recruiter when people aren't hiring? Uh, yeah, so I, I think the problem is we think about with them, they're not hiring today. You have to get them thinking about, well, what are they going to be hiring in September? What are they going to be hiring into 2021? I mean, I'd be offering to build out a free hiring plan and walk them through the process of what that recovery hiring plan might look like. The reason I think that's important is because people think about, I don't need anybody today. And when I have the conversation, they say, but I might need somebody in September. Well, we need to start looking for them now. By the time they give two weeks, if they have an existing job, because good people are usually already working. And by the time you go through the interview process, check their references, that takes up all of August. You post the ad, you do the interviews. I mean, like it is an eight week process. So as I start July, I'm really already hiring for September. So this idea of, well, nobody's hiring. Well, everybody's hiring. They're just not hiring today. And oftentimes they have no concept of how the future is going to sneak up on them. So I would just plan out their hiring into the future. Yeah, and I mean, they, I guess, you know, coming from a from an accountant standpoint is that's very nice, Marty, but I need cash now. Um, and and I guess the, the point or maybe a takeaway there is, listen, there's going to be a bit of pain here, uh, financial pain. Absolutely. And so you need to figure out how to get through that financial pain. But once you're in the groove of thinking ahead like that, um, maybe you're, you've got a more resilient business coming out of it. You're right, Clay. I mean, I, I don't have any, again, silver bullet for, I need sales today. I mean, I have literally said to people, listen, here, then you need to run your business in the morning and the afternoon, you need to go moonlight and do something else. If you're that strapped for cash and you can't qualify for government programs, like, so yeah, the idea, and particularly executive recruiting is a good example where if it's, if it's even if somebody said, let's go now, and it's going to be, a month and a half to have that person in place that's not immediate cash flow so yeah but immediate cash flow and your needs for that can't necessarily derail your business plan yeah yeah totally agree all right i don't think we have any more questions here i'm sorry if i've missed anybody um yeah if you have any questions maybe we'll throw uh we'll throw marty's uh contact back up on the slide for a second and of course i'll uh email out uh, a follow-up to this video as soon as I can get to it, hopefully tomorrow. Um, and then uh, just watch in our email channels for the replays if anybody wants to watch one of our webinars again and keep an eye on for um, for upcoming webinars. As I said, we're going to slow down the cadence over the summer a bit, um, just while everybody's on summer holidays. Thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time. And uh, feel free to hop on Google, leave us a review. Thank you so much. Marty, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Clay. All right, bye for now.